Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We studied the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular lesson is number two in a new series on the Great Controversy. That seems to be a big deal among Adventists. Let's see what they have to say. The central issue, it says, the title of our lesson, Love or Selfishness? Hmm. This is lesson number two for April 13 of 2024, and we would like to begin with a word of prayer as we usually do. Our wonderful Father, we turn once again to the messages of Scripture to try to learn about the intricacies and the ins and outs of this great controversy, the war behind every war. May we understand it more clearly so that we may protect ourselves and avoid the evils that the devil is trying to perpetrate is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> for someone who is reading the biblical story for the first time, it might seem strange that God chose the children of Israel, and then, a long time later, Jesus wept on the Mount of Olives talking about their destruction. Does that suggest that God did not foresee what was coming? What led to this disaster? Try to imagine yourself as, an overlo as overlooking this history and all its details and trying to understand God's role in all of it. And I might add, if you're a Christian who really wants to understand the Bible, you should try to think of Satan's role in all of this as well. Does the destruction of Jerusalem foreshadow what is in the future for the entire earth? That is what Jesus seemed to imply by what he said in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And of course, we could discuss those chapters for a long time. There's no question about the fact that Satan is determined to either destroy or deceive God's faithful people down through the generations. He's done it. He continues to do it. He will continue as long as God allows it. This lesson is mostly based on the book by Ellen White called The Great Controversy, chapters 1 and 2, pages 17 to 48. Two major points of emphasis in this lesson are as follows, and we'd like to have you look, at, look for these as we, as we work our way through. Jim? From the Bible Study Guide, as a result of the rejection of Christ, Judah officially is a political entity. Lost, excuse me, as a politi political entity, lost his favored nation status as God's special people and suffered the horrific experience of the destruction of Jerusalem. God established His people, the remnant of Israel, incorporated into it both Jews and Gentiles, and staved it from the cataclysm that befell Jerusalem in A.D. 70. God led His church into its mission to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, calling people of all nations to receive the good news and to join His people, His new, new people. people. So uh, now he's... There's a he, short poem that goes like this. How odd of God to choose the Jews. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it makes you think. It, yeah. it, it's, it's a good uh, <laughs> yeah. jumping off well, place. If you read, and unfortunately we can't look at all these passages because it would just take way too long. Matthew 23, 37 and 38 and John 5, 40. What do these verses suggest? Let me just, let me just choose one of them. Let's look at John 5, 40. Uh, yet you are not willing to come to me. This is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. You're not willing to come to me in order to have life. Not willing to come to me in order to have life. What do these verses suggest to you about how Jesus felt sitting on the Mount of Oz and looking over at the temple one week before his crucifixion? Luke chapter 19, 41 to 44. He came closer to the city and when he saw it, he wept over it, saying, If you only knew today what, if, what is needed for peace, but now you cannot see it. The time will come when your enemies will surround, will surround you with barricades, blockade you, and close in on you from every side. They will completely destroy, destroy you and the people within your walls. Not a single stone will they leave in its place because you did not recognize the time when God came to save you. There's one stone that I have personally touched, 
that's still in its place. It was part of the outside wall, not, not, uh, uh, not a part of the temple itself. Okay. It weighs 160 tons. And you lifted it, right? <laughs> no, I didn't lift it. <laughs> I, I found out you can't even put a piece of paper in between it and the other stones. Amazing stuff. And it was not cut there. It was, not, it was cut in. somewhere else and brought in and put Perfect. in place. Wow. Perfect. And of course, there would be not one stone above another stone because... Because the temple the itself was torn down. Because the gold, I understand, yeah. the melted. And yeah, melted. the heat of the fire melted the gold, and people were dig trying to move the stones to get the gold out. To get the gold out, yes. How would you feel if you were watching your entire family about to destroy themselves? Hmm. That's speaking of from God's view, from yeah. the Bible study guide. <clears throat> By the rebellion against his loving kindness, they, that is the Israelites, fortified his divine, not fortified, forf forfeited. forfeited his divine protection. God does not always intervene to limit the results of his people's choices. He allows the natural consequences of rebellion to develop. God did not cause the slaughter of innocent children in the destruction of Jerusalem. The tragic death of the innocents was Satan's act, not God's. Satan delights in war because it stirs the worst passions of the human heart. Down through the centuries, it has been his, that is Satan's purpose, to deceive and destroy and then blame his evil actions on God. That's from so, the Bible study guide for Sunday. We have another passage that talks about some of that kind of stuff. Matthew 24, Myra? Yeah, verses 15 to 20. You will see the awful horror of which the prophet Daniel spoke. Now, I'm going to interrupt for a second. Notice Jesus says that a prophecy that occurred 500 years before, he he's just talks about it. Well, it's just going to happen. That's obvious. I mean, it's prophesied it's as if there's no, there shouldn't be any surprise that God's prophecies just come to pass. But it was how many years before? 500 years. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, the awful horror that Daniel spoke about. It will be standing in the holy place. Note to the reader, be sure to understand what this means. Then those who were in Judah must run away to, to the hills. Someone who is on the roof of his house must not take the time to go down and get his belongings from the house. Someone who is in the field must not go back and get his cloak. How terrible will be those days for a woman who is pregnant and for mothers with little babies. Pray to God that you will not have to run away during the winter or on Sabbath. Good News Bible. Okay. Got a very quick comment. So uh, you talk with folk and they'll say, Sabbath, yeah, it was done over with. You see, yeah. we do not need to anymore. But the Lord is saying, Pray that it's not going to be, and you know, and then you go to Isaiah 66 mm -hmm. from Sabbath to Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, some facts about Jerusalem, but we don't have time to. We would all have to sit down and read the entire account from Josephus, but we don't have time for that. So let's see if we can nail down a few known facts. The tragic fall of Jerusalem may be delineated, at least in part, by the following historical details. One. Jerusalem was destroyed during the first Jewish war from AD 66 to AD 73. Its annihilation commenced toward the end of the reign of the Emperor Nero, AD 64 to 68. The war broke out when Gesius Florus, the freshly appointed Roman procurator to Judea, took a large amount of money from the temple treasury in Jerusalem. I'm sure the Romans felt like, we rule here, we'll just take whatever we want. The two, imagine what the, how the, the Sadducees felt about that. Mm. The two major Roman generals sent to quash the revolt were Vespasian and his son Titus, both later became emperors. And I had the privilege of one time walking through a very narrow tunnel that you, some people don't think you were supposed to walk through, but to find a place where a project had been done and signed there, well not signed, but carved in the rock, Vespasian and Titus. Mm. Both of their names right there. Um, 
the defenders, for the most part, throughout the, through the siege, the defenders of the city were splintered into factions and fought among themselves, uniting only to repulse the imminent attacks of the Romans. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Jerusalem was guarded by three walls. The first two walls fell to the Romans in April of AD 70, and the third was breached several months later on August 30. August 30 sorry. The temple was burned on the same day. According to Jewish historian Josephus, more than one million people died during the siege of Jerusalem and an estimated 100,000 were taken captive. Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. The booty that the Romans took from Jerusalem funded the construction of the Colosseum, one of the most visited monuments in Rome. And what was that Colosseum used for? Torture Christians. Torture and killing, feeding Christians Christian. to the lions and, and Putting the, tying them up on poles and burning them to light the, and et cetera. The place, yeah. Didn't know this, this is new. That yeah. they Six, it. Yeah. bereft of its city, Jerusalem, and its temple, Judaism suffered profound changes. The center of the Jewish religion shifted from the temple, sacrifices, and priests to the law. Who, uh, to the, law. the Sadducees, the sacerdotal class, the ones, the, the priests and the ones who were in charge of the temple, lost most of their power, and Judaism became rabbinical. In other words, the Pharisees took over. And you had to be a rabbi to have any word to say. And, they, and they, what, what the Jews had left was the scriptures. That's what they had left. In AD 70, when Jerusalem was finally destroyed by the Roman uh, armies, many of the Christians living in Jerusalem had remembered the warnings of Jesus and fled. God could have prevented the Roman invasion, so why didn't he? Did any of the, the non-Christian Jews learn about Jesus' warning and flee with the Christians? Did they think the warning was just foolish? There are many promises in the Bible, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, suggesting that God will protect his children as far as possible. In the larger context, all those who remain faithful, finally, will have a home with him in heavenly places. It is much easier to understand martyrdoms and, and deaths, etc., in this larger context. So what happened that made it possible for most of the Christians to flee from Jerusalem and thus avoid being killed? Charles, I think that's yours. Is that mine? Um, I think it's All right. Is it Jim? God's mercy, <coughs> grace, providence, and knowledge, and foreknowledge are clearly revealed in the events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem. Cestius Gallus the Roman, and the Roman armies surrounded the city. In an unexpected move, when their attack seemed imminent, they withdrew. The Jewish armies pursued them and won a great victory. With the Romans fleeing and the Jews pursuing, the Christians in the Jerusalem fled to Pella and Perea, beyond the Jordan River. Now, Pella is close to the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. So, there's the southern end of the Sea of Galilee, and a ways, a little ways away from it, over in the Decapolis, the, the Greek Gentile territory. So the Christians were not bar bothered when all this took place. Must not be too far from Petra then. Petra's a little far, farther east. Well, Petra would be farther south. Darth, this, is far, this is north. Oh, oh, the north end of the, of the Dead Sea. Okay. No, did I say Dead Sea? I thought you said Dead Sea. Maybe I did. You're I, thinking I of Galilee. I sea of Galilee. Galilee. Okay. It's, it's near the southern end okay. of the Sea yeah. of Galilee. I'm sorry. misspoke. From the writings... That's, that's in current day Jordan? Yes. Yeah. yeah. From the writings of Alan G. White, um, Charles, I guess this would be yours. The promise sign. Number 14, right? Uh, 12. Bottom of 12. 12. 12. 12 over here. Okay, right here. Okay. The promise sign. From the... The promise sign. Okay. Uh, the promise sign had been given to the waiting Christians. And now an opportunity was offered for all who would to obey the Savior's warning. Events were so overruled... Overruled. Overruled that neither Jews nor Romans should hinder the fight of the Christians. Events were so overruled. Yeah, isn't that amazing? 
Right, so no one, I mean, so you're free the, to run. Remember, yeah. remember that went right after Stephen was stoned and Paul took up his thing and then of course he went to the Christian side, but right. Christians were, were persecuted and tortured yes. and killed and all that kind of stuff. So the Jews were against them and the Romans the were against, were against them. them. But now the Jews are, trying, are, are, are chasing the Romans. The Romans were retreating for some reason and the Jews were chasing them. So the Christians just right. 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 had an easy opportunity to get out of town. And uh, did I read it somewhere that not one Christian died? Well, there, it's, the, the ones pretty, who pretty could close, run. Right. Pretty close to true, yeah, I, as far as we know. Right, yeah. right. We often think of the great controversy as a spiritual warfare. However, a careful look at events down through history makes it clear that many, many Jews and later Christians were killed as a result of events connected to the great controversy. So why does God allow Christians to be martyred? Gordon? Hebrews 11, 35 to 38. Through faith, women receive their dead relatives raised back to life. Now that's the opposite of allowing them to be killed. <laughs> Others refusing to accept freedom died under torture in order to be raised to a better life. Some were mocked and whipped and others were put in chains and taken off to prison. They were stoned, they were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went round clothed in skins of sheep or goats, poor, persecuted and ill-treated. The world was not good enough for them. They wandered like refugees in the deserts and hills, living in caves and holes in the ground. It's from the Good News Bible. <clears throat> Go ahead and read the next one as well. In Revelation 2.10, don't be afraid of anything you are about to suffer. Listen, the devil will put you to the test by giving some, by having some of you thrown into prison and your troubles will last 10 days, 10 prophetic days, presumably, yes. or 10 years. Be, be faithful to me, even if, if it means death, and I will give you life as your prize of victory. Good News Bible. So that would have to be, okay, if you die, so the award of eternal life has to come later, doesn't it? Myra? Okay, Ellen G. White says, in vain were Satan's efforts to destroy the Church of Christ by violence. The great controversy in which the disciples of Jesus yielded up their lives did not cease when, they, when these faithful standard bearers fell at their posts. By defeat, they conquered. God's workmen were slain, but his work went steadily forward. Great Controversy, page 41. Yeah, this is, this is one of the strange stories of Christianity. Christ won the Great Controversy by dying. That's, that's just wrong, isn't by it? By defeat, they conquered. Yeah. Okay, how do we explain the fact that many of those who suffered martyrdom still were talking about the reality of God's love while they were still alive? So, I mean, and some of them were singing as they were burning. Look at some of the verses that talk about the troubles that the early church faced. By, from our Bible study guide, throughout the early centuries of Christianity, the Christian church grew rapidly, despite imprisonment, torture, persecution. Faithful believers totally committed to Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, proclaimed His word with power. Lives were changed and tens of thousands were converted from our Bible study guide. And so let's just quickly run through some of the things that they faced. Threats. Jim, can you take Acts 4, 17 there? But to keep this matter from spreading any further among the people, let us warn these men never to speak to anyone in the name of Jesus. Okay, that was a threat. Then imprisonment? Acts 5, 17 and 18. Then the prime priest and all his companion, mem companions, members of the local party of the Sadducees, became extremely jealous of the apostles. So they decided to take action. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. It's kind of like what we do now if we, people don't agree with you, you lock them up if you, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, medical information or what. Okay, and persecution, Charles? <clears throat> Acts 8, Acts 8 uh, verse 1, and Saul approved of his murder. Murder. 
Yes. Remember, that was Stephen. That, that was Stephen. That very day, the church in Jerusalem began to suffer cruel persecution. All the believers, except the apostles, were scattered throughout the provinces of Judea and Samaria. Okay, remember earlier we talked about what happened about 40 years later at the destruction of Jerusalem. Here we have, they're still trying to kill all the Christians, but now they're busy chasing the Romans so the Christians have a free opportunity to, to escape. To escape, yes. And then death. Acts uh, chapter 7, verse 59 and 60, they kept on stoning Stephen as he called out to the Lord, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not remember the sin against them. He said, as he died. And then Acts 12, 2. Acts 12, 2. He, King Herod, had James, the brother of John, put to death by the sword. And I find that quite interesting because killing someone by a sword is supposed to be reserved for Roman citizens. Mm. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to be killed by the Mm. The, the, the better method, the, the first-class method. Yeah. King Herod, so, King, uh, who was it that uh, John the Baptist said, uh, and it was Herodian? Herodias? Right. Was this the same gentleman who uh, died? No. Killed yes. The king? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Herod, it was. Yeah, it's so the Herod same Herod killed uh, John the Baptist. Herod killed James. James as well. Yeah. Mm. Churches multiplied through all of these threats and killings and violence and so forth throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. Acts 9.31. <clears throat> and so it was that the churches, that the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had a time of peace. Through the help of the Holy Spirit, it was strengthened and grew in numbers as it lived in reverence for the Lord. Good News Bible. And then from the Bible study guide, the bastions of hell were shaken the shackles of Satan were broken. Pagan superstition crumbled before the power of the resurrected Christ. The gospel triumphed in the face of overwhelming odds. The disciples no longer cowered in the upper room. Fear danced away like a fading shadow. <laughs> That's beautifully put together. The yeah. Bible study guide for Tuesday. So what do you think caused the early Christians to be ready to face death without flinching? They had been given a challenge and they had help. Myra? Mark 16, 15 says, He, Jesus, said to them, Go throughout the whole world and preach the gospel to the whole human race. So that was their challenge, okay? Yes. Then in Acts 8, one verses, eight. Uh, uh, one chapter 1, verse 8, yeah. Jesus said, But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power and you will be a witness for me in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Good News Bible. Well, now, question. Has the Holy Spirit come upon the Seventh-day Adventist Church in recent times, like it did upon them? If not, why not? And if so, when did it happen and what happened? Nobody's speaking up. Well, do we count Mrs. White? Yeah, we could count that. Sure. Well, our Bible study guide says the gospel penetrated the remotest corners of the earth. Colossians 1.23. Although the last of the disciples, John, died at the end of the first century, others picked up the torch of truth and proclaimed the living Christ. Pliny the Younger, governor of the Roman province of Bithynia on the north coast of modern Turkey, wrote to Emperor Trajan around AD 110. Pliny's statement is significant because it was nearly 80 years after the crucifixion. Pliny described the official trials he was conducting to find and execute Christians. He, Pliny the Younger, stated, quote, for many persons of all ages and classes and of both sexes are being put in peril by accusation, and this will go on. The contagion of this superstition, Christianity, mm -hmm. has spread not only in the cities, but in the villages and rural districts as well. Wow, terrible thing, right? 
In Colossians 1.23, Paul himself wrote, you must, of course, continue faithful on a firm and sure foundation and must not allow yourselves to be shaken from the hope you gained when you heard the gospel. It is of this gospel that I, Paul, became a servant. This gospel which has been preached to, every, to everybody in the world. It was probably a little bit of an exaggeration, but... Well, we, we, the whole two paragraphs, we, uh, we're uh, to be talking about what the Adventists are doing. Uh, Mara touched a little bit when Adventism started, it really spread all over yeah. the world. 26-year-old, um, oh, what was her name? Her last name was Kellogg, and her uncle was the governor of Minnesota, I think. Yeah. She went to India, to Bengal. Mm -hmm. You know, young people went all yeah. over, and then I think something great is going to happen very soon. Yeah. Within our lifetime, something great has to happen. Is there oh. something we can learn from this experience of the early church that might impact us in our day? We tend to be so caught up in our professions, our hobbies, families, etc., that committing our lives to spreading the gospel as they did seems impossible. Could that change? Well, you're not going to like it, what I'm about to say. Organized church will not. Exactly. No, no, the organized church will not. It, it, it's bankrupt uh, spiritually. Oh, no, it's, it's a state-created cr entity, <laughs> creature. It's a corporation, I'm and they, it has eternal life as long as the fees are paid to the government. <laughs> the early Christian church grew not only because its members preached the gospel, but also because they lived the gospel. Are we doing that? We do not know to what extent the church was supporting the early Christian disciples and apostles, but they apparently dedicated their lives almost completely to spreading the gospel. Now we know Paul, we know there were times when Paul worked all night yes. making tents and whatever, so he could preach the gospel all day. That day is going to come wow. very soon. Do you think that the time will come when God will once again pour out his Holy Spirit and empower Christians to work miracles? and the spreading of the gospel? Yes. Hmm. God's plan ultimately is to restore physical, mental, social, and spiritual wholeness to all of his faithful children. You know, on that, on that note, back with uh, Job, the philosophy was, if you're well off financially and your health is good, God is smiling on you. Mm -hmm. And if if it's not, then then you you must have done something wrong. Yeah. Well, if you're well well off financially and your health is good, why would you look around for a different philosophy, mm -hmm. a different way of looking at God? Because God's blessing you. Why would you possibly give me any any logical explanation as why you would want to change horses? Well, some of those people still feel a need. Uh, Those are rare. Yeah, okay. probably. They may feel a mental need mm -hmm. rather than a physical yeah, need. Yeah. yeah, or emotional, yeah. whatever, sure. But uh, the, the economics and uh, health are a pretty big part of, uh, of the equation. That restoration that we're looking forward to, of course, will happen at the Second Coming. Oh, sure. What was it that made the Christian experiences stand out from all those around them and attracted the attention of others? Hey, Gordon, is that yours? John 13, 34, 35. And now I, that is Jesus, give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Good if this Bible. is true, what does it say about the rest of the people living on the earth? <coughs> Bible study guide says, love is the norm of Christian communities in the first few centuries. Tertullian. Okay. Tertullian. Mm -hmm. In the early Christian, the, an early Christian theologian claimed, it is mainly the deeds of the love, of a love so noble that lead many to put a brand upon us. That's this is the brand, okay? Yeah. See, they say how they love one another's chapter 39 from... His apologies. Yeah, apology. mm -hmm. And there you can look it up if you want. There's the yeah. website. One of the greatest revelations of God's love was demonstrated when two devastating pandemics 
plagued the early centuries around A.D. 60 and again A.D. 260. Christians stepped forward and ministered to the sick and dying. Wow. These plagues killed tens of thousands and left entire villages and towns with scarcely an inhabitant. The unselfish, sacrificial, caring, loving ministry of Christians made a huge impact on the population. Over time, thousands and eventually hundreds of thousands and then millions in the Roman Empire became believers in Jesus during these two epidemics. Love, outgoing concern and organized selfless care for the sick and dying created an admiration for these believers and the Christ they represented from our Bible study guide. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing we don't talk more about that. Yeah, we need yeah. to. Faith was palpable. Yeah. While we do not have much in the way of information about the pandemics that hit those times, educated guesses suggest possibly the bubonic plague or smallpox or measles even, or phyloviruses similar to the Ebola virus. Notice these words quoted by Rodney Stark in his book, The Rise of Christianity. That would be mine, I believe. Hmm? Dionysius, one of those early Christians, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them departed this life serenely happy, for they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of the, their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. Hmm. That looks like an interesting book. Could Christians be something like that in 2024? Would Seventh-day Adventists be ready to do it? Would it be possible in countries like the USA, Australia, or Western Europe in our day? Hmm. I will have to tell you real quickly, my freshman year in high school, I was attending a boarding academy and the 1957 flu epidemic came through. And almost every student in that school got the flu. And many of them, probably 50% or so, their parents came and picked them up and took them home. But the others were still left there. There were 12 of us left who did not get sick. And we, our full-time job was, and I just, I, I commiserate with these people, our full-time job was going to the cafeteria, picking up food, delivering to students and taking and finding out problems and asking for the nurse to come. And to, that's all we did. Mm -hmm. Why? There was no reason to hold classes. There was only 12 students in the school that were still walking around. Back then, they did, probably didn't know the value of vitamin D. Well, whatever the reason was, yeah. Ellen, uh, the gospel, Ellen White says, the gospel continued to spread and the number of its adherents to increase. It penetrated into regions that were inaccessible even to the eagles of Rome. Said a Christian expostulating with the heathen rulers who were urging forward the persecution, you may, quote, kill us, uh, torture us, condemn us. Your injustice is the proof that we are innocent nor does your cruelty avail you. It was but a stronger invitation to bring others to their persuasion. Quote, the oftener we are mown down by you, the more in number we grow. The blood of Christians is seed. And that was another statement from, or more quoted by Tertullian anyway. Ellen White, Jim? The mysterious province, excuse me, the mysterious providence which permits the righteous to suffer persecution at the hand of the wicked has been a great, excuse me, has been a cause of great perplexity to many who are weak in the faith. Some are even ready to cast away their confidence in God because he suffers the basest of men to prosper while the best and purest are afflicted and tormented by their cruel power. How it is asked, can one who is just and merciful and who is also infinite in power tolerate such injustice and oppression? This is a question with which we have nothing to do. God has given us sufficient evidence of his love and we are not to doubt his goodness because we cannot understand the workings of his providence. Oh, There's a providence. lot of mysteries that we don't understand this side of the... They, they call that theodicy, right? 
Well, yeah. theodicy implies that God is actually doing something there at that, but I suppose it would be, yeah. Consider these questions posed in the Bible study guide. Charles? Bible study guide, number one, what value does persecution serve? Faith spreads like wildfire. Why do <laughs> you think God allows his people to suffer at times? And though in some cases, such as in the early church, good was able to come of it, what about times where it appears that nothing good has come out f from it? Why in situations like this is the personal experience of God's love so important in order to maintain faith? There is plenty of evidence that persecution will shift out the nominal Christians. Not too long ago, I stood in second service. I said, today, if you lost your job, how many of you workers will be faithful Seventh-day Adventists a year from now? But anyways, yeah, that day is here. It's coming. Mm -hmm. It is coming. So um, would that be enough to bring down the Holy Spirit on those who remain? Wow. How would you respond if a friend asks you these questions? What is God in my suffering? If he loves me, why am I going through such a difficult time? If you are faithful, God has a rich reward for you in the future. But Satan is determined to destroy all God's faithful people while he has a chance to do so. How and the seven last plagues, let me interrupt. The yes. seven last plagues is Satan's attempt to destroy all of God's people if he can. Go ahead. But they're all sealed, aren't they? Yes. They're all sealed. God will not allow them to be. So Satan sends the, the plagues. He's trying to kill God's people, yes. but all he can kill is his own people. How can local church become a caring community to impact the world? Discuss practical ways to apply this week's study. Okay, so why now we're going to get down to the nitty gritty. Why did Jesus co-mingle events connected with the destruction of Jerusalem and the final events of this earth's history? Why are prophecies of first, second, and third comings of Jesus commingled? There are some prophecies concerning things that are going to happen at the third coming, even in the Old Testament. Ellen White took a cue from Matthew 27 and started her book on the Great Controversy by reviewing what happened to Jerusalem. We've already talked a little bit about that, but Gordon? A cue from Matthew 24, by the way. Uh, from the Bible study guide, from the vantage point of secular history, Jerusalem and the second temple were destroyed because the Jews rebelled against the superpower of the time, the Roman Empire, and were mercilessly crushed by its might, both in an act of vengeance and as a deterrent to other potential rebels. In the centuries that have lapsed since the fall of Jerusalem, believing Jews have generally interpreted the destruction of Jerusalem as a disciplinary measure that God allowed. Some scholars of Judaism have said that the Jews sinned by transgressing God's laws, becoming immoral. Others believe that the Jews were too fractious and divided, never having learned the lesson of unity. Whatever the case, God preserved a remnant to carry on his purposes. Now, those are different versions that the Jews, <coughs> different explanations Jews have given for their destruction of Jerusalem, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay? However, the Bible, especially the New Testament, offers a different explanation for the destruction of the temple. Yes, rebellion, iniquity, moral and social corruption, and internal strife and division were certainly major factors that led to the downfall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. But the situation that caused that tragedy was more profound than these factors alone. To help us understand what caused the temple's destruction, several important points from both the Old Testament and New Testament need to be highlighted. Taken together, these points help us to understand the main reason for the temple's de demise, and that is Israel's leadership rejection of Christ and of God's covenant. So the leadership, the, the Bible study guide is saying that the leadership of Israel rejected Christ and God's covenant, and that's why Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. Because unfortunately, too many of the Jews just followed leaders. 
Okay, the great controversy began in heaven. We know that. But it has continued, it continues still. Review the history and consider how it might have related to the history of the Hebrews and finally the Christians. So here are some of the steps in the history. The original temple. The original temple from the Bible study guide says, first, the original temple of, Jer of Israel built by Solomon was destroyed by Babylonians in 586 BC. Some 20 years after Judah was conquered by Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 1.1. 1, 1. Two. The destruction happened approximately 100 years after the northern Israelites fell into apostasy and were conquered by the Assyrians. However, these two events, Israel's demise and the destruction of Solomon's temple by the Babylonian forces, did not transpire simply because the Jewish nation failed to learn how to unite and because of its or because moral or because of its moral declension. declension. That's their fall, their fall. Their fall. Northern Israel disappeared as a nation because they rejected God's covenant and went after other gods. That's from first There's some King very 12. potent verses there. Yeah. Um, mostly in First Kings and Second. First and Second Kings. Not not one of the northern kings. Was good. Followed good. Yeah. Not one. No. They were all evil. So, yeah. Like Israel, Judah had wicked kings and corrupt elites bent on idolatry. Over time, Judah's periods of idolatry also increased in frequency and intensity. However, unlike northern Israel, Judah did not have a permanent official national policy of replacing God's religion with paganism. For this reason, God permitted the destruction of Judah's temple and its capital city in 586 B.C. and the temporary exile of its people as a strategy for national renewal. Okay, that's the first temple. Now the second temple. Our so the, first, the first temple was Solomon's temple. Solomon's uh, temple, yes. Second, the second temple was destroyed in the year A.D. 70 by the Romans. Some 35 years after Jesus foretold the following three events. One, God would take the kingdom from Judah and give it to another nation. That means the Christian church would become his faithful people as opposed to the Jewish nation. Two, Judah's house, the temple, would be left desolate, Matthew 23, 38. And three, the temple would be completely destroyed, Matthew 24, 1 and 2. The reason for this triplet judgment Judah's leadership not only failed to bring forth the fruit of the kingdom of God, Matthew 21, 43, but, all, but as did northern Israel of old, consciously refused to remain under the jurisdiction and shelter of God's wings, Matthew 23, 37. In AD 31, the leaders made an official, conscious, and deliberate decision to reject God's covenant, his salvation, and his Messiah. And as a result, God allowed the earthly temple to be destroyed. And then God's grace. Jim? Third, God gave Israel and Judah all the grace necessary for the redemption and restoration before he permitted them to suffer the penalty for breaking his convent, covenant. From the time of Moses to the destruction of the second temple in AD 70, a span of more than 1500 years, Judah experienced God's unremitting love Despite his, their failures, God was willing to work with them as long as they were willing to remain in his covenant. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm reading his covenant and be... My thing is jumping here. I'm so sorry. You have it? And be transformed. There it is. You got it? Uh, and to be transformed by his power, grace and power. Even when the Jewish leaders eventually decided to reject God, which was followed by Jesus' pronouncement of doom against them, God gave them more than 35 years before he... I'm sorry. It's down further. It's further down, yeah. Sorry. In the next section there. Yeah. 35 years before he executed that verdict. During his... During this probationary period, Christians such as Peter in Acts 2 and 4, 2 to 4, 
Stephen in Acts 7 and Paul in Romans 9 to 11 pleaded with them to accept Jesus as the Messiah and to participate in God's new covenant. Sad to say, instead of heeding these calls, the leaders sealed their decision to reject Christ with the heavy heavy-handed persecution of Christians that culminated in the murder of Stephen in A.D. 34. However, even in the decision to reject Judah as his representative nation, God continued to call individual Jews to enter his new covenant and to be saved in his kingdom. Adult Bible study guide. Okay, so God called them out individuals even though he couldn't no longer work with them as a nation. Charles? You prepared for the, the fourth. Plans. Yeah. The plan of salvation, fourth. Despite the setbacks caused by the covenant betrayal, God continued his plan of salvation and his actions to resolve the great controversy. God promised that Jesus, who was the seed of Eve, of Abraham, all this text, would bring salvation for humanity liberating them from the dominion of the devil and would restore God's reign on earth. At the same time, God promised that Jesus, the true Lamb of God and the fulfiller of the earthly sanctuary types would save humanity from the guilt and the power of sin. Through the history of humanity, may, though the history of humanity may uh, seem Disdirectional or directionless, directionless, as at times, and left to the whims and devices of the devil and the human nature, the scriptures show a clear progress of God's purposeful and intentional implementation of His plan of promise of salvation. Let me interrupt for a second. There's a wonderful pro uh, statement by Ellen White. He talks about. We look at the events in the world, we see powerful nations rise and do all these kinds of things, but if we pull back the curtains, behind we see God work slowly working out His plans. So it goes right along yes, with yes, this statement. Yes. When His own people failed Him, God worked relentlessly to bring them back to Him and to rescue humanity from the mire of sin. Abraham. Moses and Judah are all examples of the rescued and redeemed. Nothing can stop God from keeping His promises and implementing His plans. Okay, so now we've seen the first temple got destroyed because of you know, their departing from God. And then the second temple? Now the second temple is a little more complicated. When they came back from Babylonian captivity, First of all, they built just an altar, and then they, they, they built a small temple, and that it was added on to and sort of, sort of uh, bit by bit, and then decide, and then Herod, in around 46, no, around 40, 30 or 40 BC, King Herod, who wasn't a fully Jew, he was part uh, Idumean, in order to gain popularity with the Jews, he got money. He had grown up as a friend of, of Caesar's, and he got money from Caesar to help rebuild that enormous temple that was, which was there at the times of Jesus, which was actually quite a bit larger in size than even Solomon's temple. Mm. And then, of course, we, we've just talked about what happened to that temple. That temple was finally destroyed. Now, some Christians are trying to build the third temple. Yeah, well, trying to, yeah. Yes. The Jews are ready to build the third temple as well. Right, they, right. They would, they would like to. Talk about being misguided. <laughs> yeah. So, types and anti-types. No, from, uh, from, again, from the Bible study guide. Fifth, the earthly sanctuary and the sacrificial system were only anti-types of the coming sacrifice and ministry of Jesus. When the first temple was destroyed and Judah lamented for its past glory, God told them that the real glory was yet future and that it depended not on materials and architecture, but on the one to whom the sanctuary pointed, that is Jesus. And I'm gonna interrupt for just a second. I'm gonna take you to Haggai 2.9, an incredible verse. 
the New Testament, now this is written way back at the time of the, you know, building up of Haggai and Zechariah were the ones who helped them build, to rebuild for the first time that the second temple. The new temple will be more splendid and more glorious is what the Greek, uh, the Hebrew says, than the old one. And there I will give my people prosperity and peace. The Lord Almighty has spoken. So what made the new temple more glorious? Jesus was there. He himself the worshiped. The Messiah himself was there speaking to his people and, and, and teaching, them, teaching, teaching, teaching them, teaching them, Ch including children yeah, sat, including that sat children. on his lap. Yep. Even though it was the most holy place was empty. Yes. Well, yeah, it was. In, in other words, the ark was not there. The ark was the ark not was there, right yeah. There. Right, right, right. Okay. So for this reason, when the second temple or Herod's temple was destroyed in AD 70, Christians did not lose hope. On the contrary, they understood that the earthly sanctuary fulfilled its mission of pointing to Jesus, to his sacrifice, and to his ministry of salvation in the real sanct heavenly sanctuary above. <clears throat> type met antitype, symbol met reality. After Jesus' incarnation, ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension, the great controversy now was focused on the heavenly sanctuary. The Epistle to the Hebrews <laughs> discusses extensively the meaning of these changes. Thus, Matthew 24 and the destruction of the Second Temple, the Epistle to the Hebrews and its focus on the heavenly sanctuary are extremely important to the Adventist understanding of the great controversy and to the entirety of Adventist theolo theology in general. It was precisely this complex understanding of the destruction of the te Temple that inspired the apostolic and post-apostolic Christians during the first several centuries. And the writings of Ellen White in the 19th century with an understanding of the church's identity and mission. Let me interrupt for just a second. <clears throat> so as the Christian church was growing, the, the Judean thing was falling apart after it, Jerusalem was destroyed. And so while they were arguing back and forth, about who would was would be the, the the protectors of the Old Testament scriptures, the Jews went with the Hebrew scriptures, and Christians, by and large, who primarily focus was on Greek, they went with the Greek translation known as the Septuagint of the Old Testament, and of course we know what happened: the Jewish system was falling apart, and the Christian uh, system was growing. So we end up with. Uh, a gospel that is large, I mean, to considerable extent, is influenced by the, by the Greek and the Greek ideas and so forth. So go ahead, I'm sorry. Continuing with the Bible study guide, having survived the destruction of the temple, the apostolic Christians shifted their focus from the temple to the heavenly sanctuary. They overcame the fear of persecution and death because they experienced the forgiveness of sins in Christ's sacrifice on the cross and looked in faith to Christ's ministry at the right hand of God in heaven. They knew they were God's people, the new Israel, called by God to proclaim his wonderful news of salvation to all humanity gripped by the power of the devil, sin, and death. They shared their love of help, love by helping the people around them with the means they had available. And they directed the attention of others to the end of the great controversy, to the end of suffering and death, when the Lord Jesus Christ shall return to the earth and forever defeat the devil and sin. That's from the Bible Study Guide Teachers section, page 29 and 30. So you can see that while the Jewish religion was focused on that temple, you can imagine, you know, they were told you're not allowed to sacrifice lambs or anything like that except there. What do you do when the temple's gone? And the Jews will tell you specifically, why, if you ask them, well, why aren't you still offering sacrifices like they, they, they were told to, like you were told to in the Old Testament? They will tell you, because we can't. The place where we're supposed to offer the lambs is now a Muslim mosque. Mm -hmm. So this lesson will be read around the world. Think about the following questions in that light. One. What uh, do you, 
What do the people in your culture think about love and righteousness? Do they still have hope that there will come a time when, humanity, when human society and its entirety will be characterized by love and righteousness? I'm going to ask you a question. How many even Christian churches are trying to answer these questions? Do they talk about it? Well, hell, it all? Hell, hell is a very precious doctrine to most Christian churches. That's so how you get to them parked with their fire insurance. But this premiums. is about love and righteousness. What does that have to do with hell? <laughs> they, don't know what, they don't even know, know freedom. So they're, if they don't understand freedom, they can't understand love. And they can't understand love, they can't understand God. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no Christian religion that, that, that really qualifies. Yeah. So why or why, why, or why not? Uh, Myra, go ahead. Yeah. How might you explain to them that there cannot be true and enduring love and righteousness apart from Jesus? Or that there, will, there can be no love or righteousness apart from his revelation of those divine qualities as seen in his sacrifice? Or that love and righteousness cannot exist without the Holy Spirit's bestowal of these qualities upon humans or his help to grow them in us. Okay. People do not want to modify behavior. They don't, they don't want to do, modify their diet. They just give me a pill to take care of the problem. They don't want to modify their behavior. Jesus died and take took care, all care of it, so forget it. They, they have no interest in listening. You, and I didn't make that stuff, make that up. Yeah. Oh. Examine your personal evangelistic activities. <clears throat> How clearly do you understand what Jesus' words, the gospel, the kingdom, mean? <clears throat> How can you live out this gospel in your own life? Hmm. How can you and your church share this gospel with smaller and, and or larger audiences around you? It's interesting that the, in the Adventist church anyway, we have learned from many experiences that there's a sweet spot, we might call it a sweet spot. If your group is too small, it probably has problems because there's not enough people there to really get something done. But if your church is too large, everybody sort of thinks that, well, I, I can just come and participate on, on Sabbath morning and someone else will take care of everything. So the sweet spot is probably somewhere around 50 to 100 or something like that uh, people. A lot of times in the churches now, they got coffee bars out. Yeah. I guess we kind of <laughs> Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these signs, these historical signs and the historical evidence we've been able to review about why things have worked out the way they have. Help us not to make the mistakes that are spiritual ancestors have made, but to hopefully bring about the final events of this earth's history is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.